Hello, Math One friends, and welcome to week one of remote learning. Um, today, you will need pencil and paper to take notes and work examples, um, as well as you will need access to Desmos, the online graphing calculator, um, or if you have your own graphing calculator, you could use that as well. Our essential question today are what are the key features of quadratic functions? So continue with unit seven where we left off. Um, our agenda, the first thing we're gonna do is do a little bit of review of 7.1 to 7.4, which is where we left off. Um, then we will work through our new material, the key concepts of quadratic functions with some practice embedded. Your homework um, for this week, you'll be taking two Canvas quizzes, one on 7.1 to 7.4, which is the one that we were supposed to have taken um, the week that school got canceled. And then you will have a second quiz on the material presented today. And for both these quizzes, you will not need an access code. Um, throughout the duration of remote learning, my office hours are going to be Monday through Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, at that time, you can email me and any questions that you have, I can set up a Google Meet if we need to. But please feel free to email me at any time, but understand that immediate responses are not guaranteed unless you email me um, during office hours. All right, here we go. So to start us off, let's do three review questions from 7.1 to 7.4, practicing adding, subtracting, and multiplying. So on your own paper, if you will work through these three questions. If you are not ready to move on at this time, please press pause. But at this time, I will move on to the next slide. All right, um, here, hopefully you can understand my work. I've tried to show how I work through each problem so you can check your answers. Notice in question number two, you have to remember to distribute the negative one in front of the second set of parentheses. And in question three, we are multiplying, so we use the area model. So notice I've listed the two factors as the dimensions of our box, then found the area of each of the four smaller boxes, listed those, and combined like terms to find my final answer. Again, if you have any questions from these, please feel free to email me. All right, so as I stated at the beginning, part of your homework this week is going to be to complete um, a Canvas quiz on 7.1 to 7.4, but that's for homework. So now we're gonna take a few notes on our new material for today. Um, first of all, you've heard the term polynomial. We've probably used that um, some already this year. It says a mathematical expression um, reminder, an expression does not contain an equal sign, containing coefficients, and if you remember, coefficients are just the number in front of a variable. So I'll make some notes here. 
Um, variables, again, variables are just letters, exponents, and constants. Constants might be another one that you don't remember, and that is just a number. To find the degree of a polynomial, it is the highest exponent of the variable represented in the polynomial. Um, just a reminder, another name for an exponent is a power. Types of polynomials based on degree. Um, the first one is called a constant. This is when your highest degree of your polynomial is zero. Here are some examples. Um, again, constants, like we said, are just numbers. Um, the last one may look a little strange with a 3x to the zero, but if you remember, x to the zero, anything to the power of zero is one. So really that's just three times one, which gives us three, which is indeed a constant. Um, the second type, which we've already studied this year, is linear. And that's when the highest degree is one. And here are some examples of some linear functions. And then lastly is quadratic. And that's the new one. That's what we're studying this unit. That's when our highest degree is two. And some examples of some quadratics are listed there. All right, we can also name polynomials based on the number of terms that they have. And these hopefully will be pretty easy for you to remember. The first one is called a monomial or monomial, however you prefer to pronounce it. Mono, mean, mono meaning one, so that's a polynomial with only one term. A binomial, like a bicycle, has two tires, so that's a polynomial with two terms. And then lastly, a trinomial, like a tricycle, tricycle that has three wheels, a polynomial that has three terms. Um, lots of times we list our answers in standard form um, when we're working with polynomials. And that just means that the terms of the polynomial are written in order of degree from highest to lowest. And for example, this is a polynomial that is written in standard form. If you notice, the first term has a degree of two. The second term, even though it's not written, is a degree of one. And then that five, which is just a constant, we could write that as a little x to the zero so we can see that those powers do descend from a 2, a 1, to a 0. So that is called standard form. Okay, now it's time to do some practice with the new vocabulary that we have just gone over. Um, for the first five questions, I want you to classify the following polynomials. You will need to use two words for each of these. The first word will either be constant linear or quadratic and the second word will either be monomial binomial or trinomial for questions six and seven you'll be putting these polynomials in standard form again reminder that is when your degrees descend from the highest power to the lowest power be careful with questions five and seven those are multi-step questions where you're going to have to do some combining like terms before you can state your final answer. So I'll give you a couple minutes to get these questions done.
I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide so you can check your answers. If you are not ready, please press pause. Okay, here are the answers to the seven practice questions that I gave you. Um, I tried to show you my work in questions five and seven um, since those were a little bit more involved. So hopefully you can follow my work. Again, please feel free to email me any questions that you may have. So I'll give you a minute or two to check your answers. I'm going to move on to the next slide. If you need more time to check your answers, please press pause. Okay, on this slide, you have 12 practice problems. Um, at the top, the polynomials are listed, and then you have a chart at the bottom, and you're supposed to classify each of these polynomials as either a constant monomial, a linear monomial, a quadratic monomial, or a linear binomial, quadratic binomial, or quadratic trinomial. So I'll give you several minutes to fill this chart in.
Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide so you can check your answers. If you need more time, please press pause. Okay, here is a copy of my answers so you can compare yours and see if you agree. I'm going to move on to the next slide. For these three practice problems, you are going to need to simplify the polynomial, write it in standard form, and then name the polynomial once again using two words. The first word being either constant, linear, or quadratic, and the second word being monomial, binomial, or trinomial. In question number one, you will need to distribute. In question number two, you will have some combining like terms. And in question three, you will need to do both of these. So I will give you several minutes to work through these problems. At this time, I'm going to move on to the next slide so you can check your answers. So if you need more time, press pause. Here are the answers. I tried to show some work using the distributive property and combining like terms. Again, I put my answers in standard form, starting with the highest degree and working it my way down to the smallest degree. Right, moving on. 
So we've got some more of a casualty here. I know there's some random pictures there. Those are what are called parabolas. That is what the graph of a quadratic function looks like. A uh, reminder, a quadratic function means you have a degree two term in the polynomial. So notice that kind of looks like a U shape. It can either open up or it can open down. Our second vocabulary word is not one that should be new to you. It's x-intercept or x-intercepts. Um, depend upon the parabola, sometimes you may have one or possibly two x-intercepts, or you might not have any x-intercepts. Um, just a reminder, x-intercepts are where the graph crosses the x-axis, and the coordinates of an x-intercept look like the following ordered pair, x, comma, zero. Next is called the vertex. The vertex is the highest or the lowest point of the graph of a quadratic. It's also known as the maximum or a minimum. So if you look at the two pictures at the top, the one on the right, that vertex would be called a maximum. And the picture on the left, that vertex would be a minimum. Again, that point is called the vertex. And the axis of symmetry, it's a vertical line, remember, so verticals up and down, that cuts the parabola in half, and it passes through the vertex. And the equation of it is, looks like x equals whatever the x-coordinate of the vertex is. There's not a lot, a lot of room um, for me to show that on this slide, but I will go through examples in later slides. Okay, I'm going to move on. If you need more time, on press, press pause. So in these four practice problems, you see the graphs of four quadratics, known as parabolas. And for each of these graphs, they want you to identify the x-intercepts and the vertex of each. Um, and for one of the graphs, you may not have two, um, two x-intercepts, so just be aware of that. Um, as you record the x-intercepts, make sure you list those as an ordered pair. Just a reminder, the y-coordinate will be zero. So I'll give you several minutes to get these done.
Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide so you can check your answers if you need more time. Price points. Here are my four answers um, to the practice problems. Notice I have listed all the x-intercepts as ordered pairs with the y-coordinate being zero. Um, and as I mentioned, if you look at question number seven, there is only one x-intercept. Um, it only touches the x-axis here. It does not cross twice like in the other three examples. Moving on. So here we have a larger picture that will be a little bit easier for me to go through the information with you. It asks us to identify the vertex, the axis of symmetry, and the x-intercepts. And then it wants to know, is the vertex a maximum or a minimum? So you probably will be fine with the vertex, finding its coordinates, the x-intercepts, and deciding if it's a max or min. The axis of symmetry is the new part. So I'm going to demonstrate here what the axis of symmetry is. Our definition said it was a vertical line that cuts the parabola in half, and it goes through the vertex. So for this example, I'm sure my line won't be very straight. That line would be my axis of symmetry. So again, please record the vertex, which will be an ordered pair, the equation of the axis of symmetry. Remember, it always looks like x equals a number, and it will be the x-coordinate of your vertex, the coordinates of the x-intercepts like we did on the previous slide, and then tell me whether this parabola has a maximum or a minimum. I'm going to move on to the next slide so you can see the answer. So my vertex has coordinates 1, negative 4. We have an x-intercept at negative 1, 0, and an x-intercept at 3, 0. Our axis of symmetry goes to the vertex. So its equation is x equals 1, because notice that when my x coordinate of my vertex is 1, my axis of symmetry is 1. And then lastly, this parabola, you can see the lowest point, not the highest point, so therefore this parabola has a minimum. All right, I want you to try this one. Same directions, identify the vertex, the axis of symmetry, and the x-intercepts, and identify if there is a maximum or a minimum. Note in this graph, you do not see any arrows, but there are understood to be arrows on these ends. So I'm going to move to the next slide. If you need more time, press pause. So here you can check your answers. Our vertex was negative 2 comma 4, so my axis of symmetry was negative 2. Again, notice the equation for the axis of symmetry matches the x-coordinate of the vertex. My x-intercepts were negative 4, 0, and the other one happened to be the origin, so the point 0, 0. And in this case, the graph has a high point, so it contains a maximum instead of a minimum. All right, moving on. So now is when you're going to need to access Desmos. Um, again, or if you have your own graphing calculator, you're welcome to use that as well. So our equation is y equals in parentheses x minus 2 
times x plus 4. Those are called factors. So this is factored form instead of our standard form that we mentioned earlier. And so when you graph that, either in your own graphing calculator or using Desmos, you should see one of these six graphs. Um, so take a minute, again, press pause, find your graphing calculator, or open up Desmos, type this in, and see which graph matches. And then when you're ready, push play and see if you agree with my answer. All right, I'm gonna move on to rebuild the answer. And the correct graph for this equation is letter C. All right, let's try another one. Again, using the graphing calculator in Desmos or your own, please type this in. Please notice out in front, that is a negative sign. You may not use the minus sign. If you're using your graphing calculator, you have to use the negative. Um, Desmos will take it as a negative. Look at this graph and see which of the six graphs are correct. I'm going to move on to the next slide. If you're not ready, please press pause. And the correct answer was A. So based on what you saw in the last two problems, I want to see if you can make some connections between the factors Again, the factors are these things in parentheses. So the numbers that you see in the factors um, and the shape of the graph. So I've got two guided questions for you on the next slide. So based on your observations, how can you, or what can you determine to answer these questions? Number one, how are the x-intercepts connected to the numbers in the factors of the equation? And then number two, what did you notice about how the parabola opens based on the leading coefficient? Again, that leading coefficient would be the number out in front. So if you can jot down some observations, and if you need to go back and look at those again, feel free. Please press pause if you need more time. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So these are sample answers that I came up with. Again, yours do not have to say the exact same thing. Um, for the first one, what I notice is that the x-intercepts are the opposite of the numbers and the factors. And that may seem like, what is she trying to explain there? So I gave you an example there. If the factor was x plus 3, I noticed that the x-intercept was negative three, and I guess technically that would be negative three comma zero if we wrote that as an ordered pair. And then for number two, I noticed that the leading coefficient, again, that number out front was negative. The parabola opened down, like in the second example, but if the leading coefficient um, was positive, the parabola opened up. So those were the two things that I noticed and was hoping that you would notice as well. So the next slide might be a little tougher because I don't want you to use your graphing calculator. Um, and it's not about cheating, um, but I really want you to, guys to see if you can apply the things that we noticed in our first two examples where we did use the calculator. So for this slide, again, I want you to match the rest. So we've got four different equations, all in factored form. I want you to match them without your graphing calculator. See if you can make connections based on the factors with the x-intercepts and the leading coefficient as to how the parabola opens.
If you need more time, press pause. I'm now going to move on to the next slide so you can check your answers. Don't be alarmed that I marked through A and C. Those are the two previous examples that we had done. So my answers were F, E, B, and D. Um, F, I knew had to open down because you had a negative leading coefficient, that negative two. And then the factors had a negative two and a positive one, which meant my x-intercepts would be the opposite. So a positive two and a positive one. And so I can try to mark those for you here. So we've got a two and we have that negative one. Um, the second one was letter E. Again, I knew that went open up because my leading coefficient was positive. And again, my x-intercepts here were a positive one and a negative three, which were the opposite of what you see in the equation. The third one, I got letter B. Again, positive leading coefficient, so it opens up. And the opposite, so we have a negative one and a positive three. And then last but not least, letter D is going to open down because of the negative out front. And then we have a negative two in the equation, which gives me a positive two for my x-intercept, a positive three, which will give me a negative three as my x-intercept. So hopefully those connections um, are pretty easy for you guys to see. All right, so um, this practice problem is going to use mostly what we've talked about today, but there are a few things maybe from earlier in the year um, you might be a little rusty on, but I want you to give it a shot. Um, I want you to try to fill in each of these blanks given the picture. Um, again, you've got your equation there, but you don't have to graph it since the graph is already provided for you. Again, notice this one is already written in standard form. But if you can go ahead and fill these in. couple of refreshers, since x-intercepts are where the graph crosses the x-axis, your y-intercept would be where the graph crosses the y-axis. Increasing, again this is from way back toward the beginning of the year, increasing is where the graph is going up. Decreasing is where the graph is going down, and then again those are x values. And then a reminder, your domain are your x's, and your range are your y's. Please press pause. If you need more time, I'm going to move on to the next slide so you can compare your answers to mine. So I have my vertex, which in this case was a maximum. So my vertex was up here at the top of the graph. And that was negative two comma four, as I had listed. Again, your axis of symmetry is that vertical line which is why it's an x equals equation that goes through the vertex. Your x-intercepts are negative 4, 0, and 0, 0. And your y-axis, excuse me, your y-intercept also happens to be 0, 0. Um, the increasing, decreasing, again, is the part we haven't done in a while. And since we talked about the axis of symmetry, cutting it in half, you kind of, like we talked about before, you read left to right. So I think my example was you're walking along and you hop on the graph and you start to increase. And then once you get to that vertex and you continue, then you are starting to decrease. And the point there where that changed was the vertex. Um, and again, looking at your axis of symmetry. So on the left side is going to be when the x values are less than negative two. So that's where it's increasing. And then on the right side, it's where your x values are greater than negative two so that is where the graph is decreasing. Um, for the domain, I actually messed this up the first time I went through it. If you notice for this parabola, there are dots um, instead of arrows. So we have stopping points. And again, we said our domain were x's and our range were our y's. 
And so for the domain, we see how far left the graph goes, which is negative five, and how far right the graph goes, which is one. And then for range, we see how low the graph goes, which is negative five, and how high the graph goes, which is four. So looking along your x-axis and looking along your y-axis. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. And I'm gonna give you another one. And let's see if you can make 100 on this one. And this will be our final practice problem for today. The one thing that is different, or one of the things that's different um, in this graph is notice that there are arrows instead of endpoints this time. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. If you're not ready, please press pause and compare your answers with mine. Notice this time the problem is facing up, so we have a minimum instead of a maximum. So for this graph, we are decreasing on the left side of the axis of symmetry and increasing on the right side. Again, on the left, the numbers are less. On the right, the numbers are greater. For the domain, because of the arrows that we mentioned earlier, this graph is gonna keep going up forever and it's gonna keep getting a little bit wider and wider and wider. So therefore your domain, your X values are all real numbers. So X can be anything it wants to be. It can be really large positive numbers, really large negative numbers, anything. And then your range are your Y values. And if you notice, the graph doesn't go any lower than negative nine, but it goes up forever. So we say that our range are Y values that are greater than or equal to negative nine. Notice I chose not to use interval notation. Um, I was trying to use more of the notation that the state of North Carolina uses for their standardized test. Well, this brings us to our homework slide and the conclusion of week one's lesson. Um, number one, you need to take the 7.1 to 7.4 quiz in Canvas. Number two, you need to take the 7.5 to 7.8 quiz in Canvas. Um, again, I did not do a test. I just broke it up into two quizzes. Just a reminder, there's no access code needed for either of those. And then number three, many of you have already done this or are in the process of getting some things made up for me but I need you guys to check PowerSchool for any missing work from quarter three and email me for instructions on how to get this work made up. Um, hope you guys have a great week. Again, please reach out to me if you need help. Again, specific office hours are from one to two, Monday through Friday, but feel free to email me at any time and I've put my email address here at the bottom for your convenience. Miss you guys, hope everyone's doing well. Take care, see you next week.